morning and welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Public Works for Friday, January 12, 2018. Commissioner Repenning, Davis and Jacinto are present. Vice President Repenning, we do have a quorum. May we start with Bureau introductions, please, starting with Bureau of Street Services. Good morning. Hector Banuelos, Bureau of Street Services. Good morning, Jim Berman, Bureau of Engineering. Good morning, Angelica Samayoa with the Bureau of Contract Administration. Good morning, Ruben Flamenco, Bureau of Street Lighting. Brett Paul Judge, Bureau of Sanitation. Good morning, Ted Jordan, Public Works General Counsel. Fernando Campos, Executive Officer, Vice President Repenning. We do not have any uh, general public, uh, sorry, let me start that again. We do not have any public comment speaker cards for today's agenda. We also do not have any commentary under the, under the Neighborhood Council comment section. We did receive a speaker card on item number one and three. Also, we received an email on item number one that was distributed to all commissioners. Thank you. Um, I will go ahead and close general public comment. I'll also close Neighborhood Council commentary. Um, is there a second to my motion to approve the minutes from our meeting of Monday, December 4th, 2017? Moved by Commissioner Davis. Uh, the minutes will be approved. Um, let's go ahead and take a couple of administrative items. Number four, we have an AFE American Restore Bureau of Sanitation and Office of Accounting requesting board approval and execution of an authority for expenditure in the amount of $357,000 for the installation of a 7,500 square feet, two inch minimum thickness UCO floor 404 topping system to restore the existing tipping floor at Central LA Recycling and Transfer Station. Khalil? Good morning, sir. You're not Khalil. No, I'm not. <laughs> uh, John Hamilton. Uh, Hi, John. He works in his division. <laughs> so this is a, uh, a topping for a, uh, a floor at our transfer station, which is over a, a tunnel, and which would be the ceiling of the tunnel. So uh, it's very important that we put on material over the surface as we found from experience that uh, has a very uh, that wears better than regular the, the regular cement that the, uh, the the floor is now made out of so this uh, gives us it wears at about 20 percent of the rate of the regular floor and uh, it's critical because if the floor wears out it, the, it's supported over a tunnel so we could have a cave in so this is something that we have to replace uh, or upgrade regularly, I imagine. That's right. This is the uh, the fourth time that we've uh, asked for a, an AE for this uh, type of application at the facility. Commissioner Davis? I wanted to find out, is there any other kind of um, substance that we could use other than this that would have longer duration in terms of usage, or is this the latest thing in So uh, initially, uh, I believe back in 2008, we had a floor actually caved in and we put out a search for a material and we uh, found a vendor and we put it down and it, we w it wasn't successful. At that point we went out and we uh, into the industry and, and uh, found out that the floor that's most used is, is, this, is this company and they have a proprietary type of formulation that they use for its application and the, how fast they can, they can put it in over a week and literally. Uh, and there's uh, specially trained uh, and there's actually a certification process that the contractors have to go through to uh, be able to apply it and that's this is what we're using so this is the best materials that we know that we know yes thank you Commissioner. okay um, I'll go ahead and make a motion on agenda item number four seconded by Commissioner Davis the item will be adopted any objections to sending it forthwith hearing no objections we'll send that forthwith thank you sir thank you Agenda item number five, a bond to release stop payment notice, OHL USA Incorporated. OHL USA Incorporated and the Ohio Casualty Insurance Company transmitting a bond to release money withheld on stop payment notice filed by American Landscape Incorporated. Bond amount of uh, $712,852.83 in connection with Machado Lake Ecosystem Re Rehabilitation Project the contractor for which is OHL USA Incorporated. Uh, is there a motion, uh, uh, is there a second in my motion to um, uh, receive this item? Seconded by Commissioner Sinto. the item will be received. Any objections to sending it forthwith? Hearing none, we'll send that forthwith. Let's go back to agenda item number one. This is with the Bureau of Street Services. It's 
Lisa, Council District 4, tree removal, tree removal permit extension <clears throat> at 3802 Holly Line Avenue, recommending that the board, number one, find that this project is categorically exempt under Article 3, Section 1, Class 3, Category 1 of the City's Environmental Quality Act guidelines, and there is no substantial evidence the proposed project will have a significant effect on the environment and is in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA. Two, find that none of the exceptions to the use of the categorical exemption is set forth in Section 15300.2 of the State CEQA guidelines apply. Three, specify that the Bureau of Street Services Urban Forestry Division, located at 1149 South Broadway, is custodian of the documents of other material that constitute the record of proceedings upon which the Board's decision is based. And four, approve the request for extension of a previously approved and issued fee tree removal permit for 10 Coast Live Oak trees and five Southern California walnut trees for new home construction. Mr. Hector Banuelos from the Bureau of Street Services. Good morning, Vice President Repenning, Commissioners, Bureau Representatives, City Attorney, Dr. Campos. Hector Banuelos with the Bureau of Street Services, Urban Forestry Division. Derek Flynn, the property owner representative, has proposed to demolish an existing single family dwelling and construct a new three story family residence at 1802 Holly Lion Avenue. The building footprint is approximately 10,515 square feet on a partial measuring approximately 78,178 square feet with moderate to steep topography. The proposed residence includes a driveway, garage, pool, and covered patio. In order to build the proposed residence, the property owner is required to perform remedial grading retaining walls, and other slope stability measures. The request for the protected tree removal permit for 12 uh, protected trees was previously heard and approved by your board on May 23rd of 2016, of 2016. The permit was paid, the tree bond was posted, and the permit was issued by the Bureau on July 25th of 2016. However, the applicant encountered project delays causing the previously issued permit to expire prior to the scheduling of the tree removals. Mr. Flynn reacquired the services of Ms. Kay Greeley, consulting arborist and registered landscape architect, to provide an updated protected tree report and reassess the property to address the proposed project impact to the protected trees. Ms. Greeley reinspected the property on May 25th of 2017 of this year, of last year and found 32 native protected trees, including two dead walnut trees growing on the property. From the time of the last inspection of the property and prior to the issuance of the previous permit, one additional coast live oak tree grew to qualifying size, measuring approximately four and a half inches in diameter by 15 feet. The Bureau Arborist reinspected the location on August 2nd of 2017 to verify the contents of the protected tree report and found the trees on the property are as stated in the, the protected tree report. The Bureau agrees reasonable development of the property will require the removal of the 13 of 13 protected trees as noted in the protected tree schedule contained in the protected tree report. The remaining 17 trees will be minimally impacted and remain in place. The project is category exempt under Article 3, Section 1, Class 3, Category 1 of the City's Environmental Quality Act guidelines, and there is no substantial evidence that the proposed project will have significant effect on the environment and is in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act. Daniel Park, Field Deputy for the Forest Council District Community Advisory Committee, were informed of the tree removal permit extension request on December 18th of 2017. The applicant in if, if approved, the applicant shall plant 16 36 inch box size coast live oaks, 16 24 inch box size coast live oak trees, and 24 five gallon size Southern California black walnuts include plantings on site to replace the removed trees. The survival of all oak trees shall, or all protected, shall be guaranteed for a period of three years by cash bond, which was previously posted. <coughs> Therefore, the Bureau request that the board approve their permit extension as amended to reflect the removal of 13 protected trees, that is eight coast live oak trees and five Southern California walnuts. I have three speaker cards on this item. Um, we'll go ahead and hear first from Linda Whitford.
Good morning. My name is Linda Whitford. Um, I am very concerned about the issue of extensions to tree removal permits that have begun coming before the board. Um, the applicant's original permit in this case was given on July 25th, 2016 and expired on November 30th, 2016. In other words, the applicant did at one time have a permit, but this permit expired over a year ago. The item before the board for approval today is framed as an extension of an existing permit, yet there is no existing permit. There is a permit that expired a year ago. Permits surely have an expiry date for a reason. Approving a new permit unreviewed in its conditions under the guise of a faux extension ex opens a Pandora's box for the city within which an applicant might conceivably continue extending a once granted permit for years on end, allowing them to retain the advantages of conditions and policies once deemed acceptable, but long since supplanted by different or more restrictive conditions and policies. This is not an entirely spurious scenario, given that development proposals have been known to languish for decades before coming to fruition. I think we are all aware that there have been shifts in the past two years in the city's awareness of threats to our trees and the importance of retaining them wherever possible. Those new awarenesses should frame consideration of this application. If extensions were formally allowable and, and a validly existing part of the permitting system for the city, city's tree removal permits, there would be no need for the board to be asked once again to approve points one through three of the agenda item. The board would need only approve the fourth point to approve the extension itself. The very act of requesting that the board once again certify points one through three makes plain that this application is being assessed, determined, and processed as a new application. As such, the board should not approve items one through three without giving them the full consideration they would receive from the board's commissioners in any other new application. To do so would amount to a rubber stamping of points one through three of the agenda item. For the board's findings and approval to be made current, Two the board's consideration of information and evidence must be made equally current. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Hall. Good morning, Commissioners. Jamie Hall with Channel Law Group. Um, I am here to let you know that I'm representing some neighbors down the street who are currently engaged in a bit of a dispute regarding the removal of 54 protected trees, and that's at 3915 Holly Line Drive. I'm not sure that the city is even aware of this because uh, they haven't applied for their tree removal permits yet. They're currently trying to subdivide the property uh, and remove uh, uh, 41 protected trees. So if you add 41 protected trees at 3915 Holly Line Drive and just down the street at 3802 Holly Line Drive, you're removing 13 trees. That's a total of 54 protected trees. I don't think the city has a, looked at the cumulative impacts associated with tree removals on this particular street. And one of the uh, exceptions to the sequel exemption is related to cumulative impacts. And it says all exemptions for these classes are inapplicable when the cumulative impact of successive projects of the same type in the same place over time is significant. So there's definitely cumulative impacts. I mean, we've got 54 protected trees being removed on the same tiny little street. The other thing I want to know is that this property is located in habitat linkage zone number nine. Uh, Fossil Ridge uh, Park is in this area. And there's another um, exception from CEQA uh, where the project may impact on an environmental resource of hazardous or critical concern where designated, precisely mapped, and officially adopted pursuant to law by federal, state, or local agencies. So again, that habitat linkage zone map was formally adopted by the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy in May of 2017. Um, and that removes the ability of the city to use an exemption. And I'll also note for that other project down the street, the city has done a full mitigated negative declaration, and yet for this project, um, they're doing a categorical exemption. So there's something strange going on here. And I would also note for that other project, after several months of dialogue, we're um, going to have a new project that's going to um, result in fewer trees being removed, and we'd like you to allow that opportunity to happen here as well. Thank you. Dr. Arnold Newman. Thank you and good morning. Um, I am the executive director of the International Society for Preservation of Tropical Rainforests and president of the Oak Forest Canyon Homeowners Association. This project is uh, within that canyon. Um, there has been, um, as 
late, um, perhaps uh, two decades of increasing drought in the Southland and throughout the United States and in certain areas. Uh, the loss of uh, protected trees has been increasingly uh, dramatic. And uh, in fact, uh, not only drought, which we are uh, in the midst of uh, through climate change, but uh, an, an increasingly exotic insect plague that you've probably heard of uh, that um, have come from imported insects. Um, California live oaks, coast live oak, um, have a, a, a longevity of some 1,500 years. Uh, as far as I can discern, and I'm a conservation biologist, um, there are oaks, at least, uh, the, the walnuts, uh, the black walnuts are somewhat more short-lived, certainly. Uh, there are certainly, I would think, not unlikely, uh, that some of the trees in question that are slated for removal, at least, um, have, were already somewhat mature when Columbus discovered America. Given that the loss of oaks, especially, um, are severe in the Southland, have to be increasingly strict on how best we can maintain those we still have and that are healthy. I thank you for your conservation uh, efforts Two minutes. On, on behalf. And uh, one last situation, uh, that this, this site as well as the very nearby um, Oak Forest Canyon, um, uh, Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, Fossil Ridge Park is very highly imbued with fossil evidence uh, of uh, certain magnitude. That's to be considered at another time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Bonwellis, if you could come back up to the podium. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, our counsel, Mr. Jordan, to kind of clarify where we're at with this. So this was a, this was a, uh, permit that we issued last year uh, in 2016 um, and so they're, they're, we need to renew that today in order for them to proceed with their project. Um, here's some concerns raised. How would you advise us to think about our action here today? Um, well, I'll let staff speak to what's, uh, what, what the duration of a permit is. They typically do expire. Um, if this permit has expired, then although the report refers to it as an extension of the permit, it's essentially the issuance of a new permit. Um, there's no deference that's owed to the prior decision of the board in issuing the permit. Um, we issue permits at a certain period of time, they expire, and if a person wants that permit back, they have to reapply for it. So the findings in the report are what are necessary when we issue a permit, and those, that's why those findings are there now, notwithstanding the fact that it, if there's language that suggests that it's an extension of the permit. It, it, the board m must make those findings in order to take an action today that would result in a new permit being issued. Can you talk to us, um, Mr. Banuelos, about the uh, replacement plan and how the replacement trees are going to fit on site? The applicant provided a, uh, a pretty comprehensive pre-replacement plan if you have copies of that, I can, I can show you. It appears that the trees do uh, fit on site. It can be planted. Okay. Um, Commissioner Asinto? Thank you, Vice President Repenning. You know, I had a question regarding the, well, the, besides the permit renewal or the new uh, application or an extension, I had a question regarding CEQA and the speakers had mentioned this may be have we considered cumulative impact? And uh, Hector, can you speak to that in terms of, 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 with the knowledge that, the current knowledge that there is tree removals in the impacted area, uh, do, are we still okay on our CEQA findings? Or do we, do you feel that we need to go back and revisit that? The Bureau is still okay with the findings. Uh, from what I heard previously, I believe there was not an application submitted yet 
on the other two projects, but we'll take those under review when we receive the applications. Okay, so can you go back a again in, in to the question of whether or not the Bureau sees this as a new application or still an extension? You're affirming that it's still an extension? We see it as an extension. It was requested as an extension of the uh, tree removal permit. However, during the time when the issue, the permit was issued previously, another tree grew of qualifying size, just a half inch over qualifying size. And the impact of that additional tree is that there's one more tree? Just one more tree, yes. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Davis? I'm trying to establish the facts as it relates to the fact that there is a valid upon which we can apply for this extension thus this proposal before us today. What is the past practice of the Bureau in terms of if in fact um, the permit has, ex has expired? Uh, what is our past practice in terms of how we handle that? Do we require, in other words, there to be a, an application for another permit or please explain circumstance, their status as it relates to tree removals? It uh, happens rarely, I guess, where the applicant ex allows the permit to expire. <coughs> of late, I guess we've had a couple of them, and where we have presented to the board for asking for an extension of the permit. Uh, we, when the applicant obtains a permit, we always try to encourage them, you know, if you have your permit, there's an expiration date, you need to have the trees removed prior to their expiration, otherwise we're gonna have to go back to the board. Point of clarification, so what we're doing here is asking for an extension of the permit? Yes, extension of the permit, and also addressing to the board that there was another tree that grew up qualifying permit, size. The permit was, is the permit currently, it's not currently valid as of when? Yes, it is not valid. As of when? As of, The permit expiration date was November 30th of 2016. Okay, and this is 2018. And what is our past practice in terms of cases presenting uh, with the time period uh, before us today? What is our practice? Um, this is, I guess, two years, right? Since the permit has been valid, correct? To today's date, yes. Somewhere around. Yes. Yeah, more a year and a half. Over a year. So what is our practice in the Bureau in terms of when, in fact, the, the permit has been over a year, uh, you know, hasn't been valid for over a year? What is our practice? Well, in this one here, we're asking for an extension because the permit applicant already paid the fees and already posted a cash bond on the previously issued permit. So what we do in most cases, or in the majority of the cases in this circumstance, that have the same facts that this one has, is that this is what we do. We just ask for an extension, no matter if it is over a year, correct? Correct. That's what we, that's what we normally do with each case? Yes. So there's nothing under the, out of the ordinary for what we do in this case than what we have done generally in other cases? That's correct. Okay, so this is what we practice pretty much. I just want to be very clear that this is how we do it. Yes. Um, okay, so my, my feeling on this is that, <clears throat> um, and Mr. Jordan, I, I would like you to chime back in here in a minute, um, is that, you know, we previously approved the permit. Um, there is no new formal information for us um, other than uh, we had a, a speaker um, present about um, a project that hasn't actually come before us uh, that is also going to be potentially removing trees, but we haven't granted that project. Um, you know, as much as this board uh, and, and I personally, um, we, we do our best to uh, avoid removing any trees unnecessarily, and we certainly always ensure that the mitigation plan is as it was intended to be, 
Um, for consistency's sake, I don't see a reason for us not to uh, to grant this request. Um, and I would I would like to, to ask you, um, Mr. Jordan, again to chime in le from a, a legal perspective. Is there any anything new uh, that we should be considering or thinking about here? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. First of all, just to remind the commission. Um, there's no deference owed and no rights vested in a previously issued and now expired permit. So we need to make the findings based on the information that exists today, not the exist, not the what existed well more than a year ago. Um, there is at least one physical difference in that there is an additional tree now. Um, the council. Uh, Mr. Hall raised an issue uh, regarding an area that, um, of which I have no direct information, but an area that was um, apparently the mapped out by the Mountains Conservancy. Uh, I don't think that information was uh, before the staff at the, when they prepared the um, CEQA recommendation, although I could be wrong on that. Um, Mr. Hall also raised an issue of um, what I believe he characterized as a reasonably foreseeable uh, cumulative impact. Um, it, it's not necessarily the case that a, a permit has to have been issued in order for that to be at least evaluated as a potential cumulative impact. So th there are some things that he has asserted to be new. Um, and, and it's unclear to me whether to what extent staff may have considered those items that Mr. Hall raised. Commissioner Cecilia. Thank you. Um, Hector, I'm going to go to that point of the habitat zone that was declared and whether or not our staff, our Bureau of Street Services, considered that in the CEQA findings uh, in that there is no exemption once the zone has been de uh, designated as a habitat zone. Can you speak to that? We're not environmentalists, Commissioner. Uh, we don't have staff environmentalists on the Bureau who, that are experts in that field. Um, the categorical exemption was uh, performed by the city, Department of City Planning. So I'm not exactly sure exactly what criteria they were using when they established the categorical exemption outside of just a single family residence construction. Okay, so there's another department that issued that categorical exemption and there may be a valid issue with that habitat zone being designated. Correct? Uh, I'm not sure if they addressed that or not, or if they investigated that. But this, if I could just interject, um, my recommendation would be that uh, staff, that you continue the item to let staff sort of really fully digest what the issues that were raised today um, and, and, and take a look at the matter. I, I don't make that recommendation lightly. In fact, it's extremely rare for me to make that recommendation. Oftentimes, my preference is for the board to, 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 to reach the merits. But in this case, uh, I do recommend that. Commissioner Davis? Um, I was going to talk about just what our attorney has discussed uh, about a concern, particularly <coughs> as it relates to this additional tree that seems to be attached to this proposal before us in terms of the extension. So for me, it raises a flag that a further review would be appropriate. And at the end of the day, uh, if the results are the same, then so be it. But at least we would have done, I think, due diligence to the fullest extent that, that we should be able to be concerned about. So um, I, I strongly uh, would support uh, having staff do a further review uh, based upon that. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Um, I think that uh, we will go ahead and, and continue. Um, I, uh, what I always like to see in these discussions, and in, in part of it is that we obviously heard this before. I wish I could say that I remembered the discussion, um, but you know, on, uh, I, I always appreciate when we get actually into the issues of the design of the home that's being built. Because for me, it's very important that when people you know, are developing um, uh, on, uh, you know, on, on the, in, in these types of areas that are very important to our overall ecosystem, 
that they are designing their structure in such a way to really minimize the amount, the environmental impact of, of the structure. And I don't feel like I have that information here. So um, that's always important for me and how I think about these items. Um, and I think what we will go ahead and do is um, follow the advice of our city attorney, um, continue the item, ask you guys to go back, um, take a look uh, at uh, the new information that's been presented uh, as well as um, the design of the property and uh, what additional measures could be taken to mitigate the impact on the protected trees here. Um, how long do we want to take? Uh, is a, is a, two weeks is probably not enough time. How about a month? That would work for uh, my office. And okay. you know, we, we do regularly uh, sit down uh, and, and look at look into these issues with the bureau and ad advise them. So we, as you know, we there are uh, another group of attorneys in my office that that sort of take the lead on these kinds of things, and so we can add this to the mix. Uh, this one, you know, there is I mean, just going through the record that you had before you. Uh, I mean, there there has been at least based on what I can tell fairly significant amount of you know, review of this project. I see a report here, Mulholland Scenic Parkway specific plan, project permit compliance and design review. So there's been, it looks like a fairly extensive amount of review. Nevertheless, um, under the city's municipal code, it's this board's responsibility to review and approve protected tree removal permits. So notwithstanding the fact that it, there appears to have been a significant amount of review, all of which takes place in the public sphere, um, it is our responsibility to to review and approve this last part, and it's a discretionary approval. So I think a bottom line is a month is good. And the applicant is not here today, correct? Uh, I, the applicant is not here, and I presume, although staff can correct me if I'm wrong, that they were advised of the hearing today. It would be, uh, you know, good for them to come next time. Um, why don't we go ahead and, and do three weeks? Let's do a three-week continuation. Great. Um, so three weeks from now would put you at Friday, February 2nd. Okay, that sounds good. The item will be continued. Um. Uh, for, for you, uh, Chairwoman, yes. if uh, the additional tree and the explanation and discussion about the need for that, I would assume would be a part of the analysis because in the presentation about this additional tree, I don't necessarily see any discussion about the addition. And I would think it would be appropriate to, if it is an additional removal, to have some deliberation about that as we know that the others that have been approved to be removed did go through a, a, a rigorous process. So some discussion about that would be helpful. There was a brief discussion within the contents of the report and the recital. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, so we'll go ahead and continue the item. Thank you very much, Hector. We'll see you soon. Right, thank um, you. We're going to move on to agenda item number two. Seven, California Environmental Quality Act compliance and project approval. Tahunga Wash at Oro Vista Avenue Maintenance Program, State Clearing House Number 20150710012, recommending the board, in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act, adopt and forward this report in transmittals, recommending the City Council, one, review and consider the negative declaration and initial study. Two, find that on the basis of the whole record, there is no substantial evidence that the project will have a significant effect on the environment and that the negative declaration reflects the City of Los Angeles's independent judgment and analysis. Three, adopt the negative declaration. Four, specify that the documents con constituting the record of proceedings in this matter are in the custody of the City Clerk, located at 200 North Spring Street, Los Angeles, California, 90012, and in the files of the Department of Public Works Bureau of Engineering, located at 1149 South Broadway, Suite 600, Los Angeles, California, 90015, and five, approve the project as described in the final initial study. Mr. William Jones. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm William Jones, Environmental Supervisor with uh, the Bureau of Engineering Environmental Management Group. And with me to answer questions is uh, Hugh Lee, Division Manager for the Bureau of Street Services Engineering Division. The action before you is the board is a recommendation for adoption of a negative declaration and approval of the project. The Big Tahunga Wash at Oro Vista Avenue Maintenance Program project site is located in the Sunland Tahunga community of the City of Los Angeles. 
the activities will occur on or within or adjacent to the Aura Vista Avenue right of way where it crosses the Big Tahunga Wash. As shown in figure one, uh, there are two project areas, area A, which is located 200 feet upstream of Aura Vista Avenue, and area B, which is located 50 feet downstream of Aura Vista Avenue. The overall project area is 2.6 acres in size, however, that can vary based on the, uh, based on the uh, event of flooding at any time. The project will restore flow under Oro Vista Avenue and the Big Tahunga Wash bypass channel to a pre-event condition. This includes cleaning, clearing, maintaining, repairing, and restoring of Oro Vista Avenue and its associated culverts, swales, and shoulders located within the wash to permit 24-hour access, access to the Riverwood community. The city would remove accumulated sediments, debris, and that may block the flow of water through the culverts and clean up the Arizona crossing. The authorized city forces include the Bureau of Street Services, Bureau of Sanitation, LA Fire Department, and Bureau of Engineering. There will be no import or export of sediments, or including vegetative debris. However, the Arundo and other trash debris will be removed and taken to a landfill, approved landfill. The cleanup of the process will take 10 to 15 15 days. As time, personnel, and funds permit, minimal preventative cleanup activities may also occur. As shown on figures two and three, uh, the 2009 station fire led to the denunation and major flooding in the watershed, which made Oro Vista Avenue impassable and inaccessible to both Riverwood community residents and emergency vehicles. The city obtained an emergency authorization from the Army Corps of Engineers to do the cleanup work. However, during that operation, the Regional Water Quality Control Board determined that the city exceeded their emergency permit authorization and then required new permits and a secret review for any future work, which includes a maintenance program. The city originally proposed to include areas A and B as well as up to 3,000 feet of the upstream perennial channel in Big Tonga Wash. However, after numerous meetings with the Army Corps, Water Board, and Fish and Wildlife, the city agreed to reduce the maintenance project scope. The final initial study, negative deck, reflects the narrowed project scope that is now presented for your consideration by the Board of Public Works and later the City Council. Once the initial study negative deck has been adopted, we expect the permits to be approved and be ready for use for the maintenance program, all to minimize the flooding impacts along Oro Vista Avenue and to protect the Riverwood community. Thank you. Any questions? Commissioner Sinto. Thank you. Uh, William, you know the, um, the final initial study neg negative declaration report, uh, there was comments, there was a public comment period. Is there anything of significance? Can you state that for the record? Uh, yeah, we, we received a uh, significant number of comments from the Fish and Wildlife, uh, the California Fish and Wildlife, and they had concerns about the 3,000 foot, 3,000 foot uh, extent of the along the perennial channel. And they were concerned about impacts to endangered species, the Santa Ana sucker and uh, native plants. However, after discussions with the, with the agencies, we took that out of the neck deck and then re, 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 uh, rewrote it and then finalized that. That is what is up for adoption. Okay, so we uh, adopted, we took things out uh, and, and uh, minimized the negative deck aspect of it. Right. So we also uh, put in BMPs, which take care of a lot of the concerns that the agencies had. Excellent. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Thank you very much, sir. Um, uh, Commissioner Jacinto has made a motion. I will second it. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, adopt this item. Any objections to sending it forthwith? Hearing none, we'll go ahead and send the item forthwith. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Thank you. Uh, moving on to agenda item number three, Council District 14. Street closure, 4th Street and Flower Street intersection and traffic lane reduction on 4th Street and Flower Street. Recommending the board, number one, find that the Board of Public Works has reviewed and considered the information in the Project Draft Environmental Impact Report, Statement Environmental Impact Report, EIS EIR, and the Project Final EIS EIR. Two, find under the California Public Resources Code, Section 21166 and the California Environmental Quality Act Guideline Section 15162 on the basis of substantial evidence gained contained in the whole record 
that since certification of the EIS, EIR, there have been no changes with respect to the circumstances under which the temporary street closure being undertaken would require a sub subsequent EIR or supplemental EIR. Number three, adopt the January 20th, 2012 Mitigation Monitoring and Reporting Program, Chapter 8 of the final EIS EIR as amended by the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority Board of Directors on April 26, 2012. And Appendix 3, Memorandum of Agreement with the California State Historic Preservation Officer, Transmittal Number 3, prepared by the Los Angeles County Metro as it pertains to construction impacts. Number 4, find under CEQA Guidelines Section 15091 the changes or alterations which have been required in or incorporated into the project which reduce or substantially lessen the significant environmental I effects as identified in the EIS EIR. Further find that there is no feasible alternative or additional feasible mitigation measures within the board's powers that would substantially lessen or avoid any significant effect the project would have on the environment. Number five, adopt the attached CEQA findings of fact and statement of variety considerations, transmittal number four, as it pertains to the temporary street closure and find that the economic, social, technological, and other benefits of the project outweigh its significant and unavoidable impacts. Number six, specify that the Metro Transit Division of the Bureau of Engineering, located at 1149 South Broadway, the board located at 200 North Spring Street, and other relevant City of Los Angeles departments are custodians of the documents or other material which constitute the record of the proceedings upon which the board's decision is based. Number seven, approve the request to temporary, temporarily close the intersection of Forest Street and Flower Street starting Friday at 7 p.m. and ending Monday at 5 a.m for nine 58-hour weekends beginning January 19, 2018 and ending March 19, 2018, subject to the conditions identified within this report. Eight, approve the peak hour exemption request on Flower Street between 3rd Street and 5th Street and 4th Street between Figueroa Street and Flower Street to allow construction work during weekday morning peak hours, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and weekday afternoon peak hours, 3.30 p.m. to 7 p.m starting January 22nd, 2018, and ending March 16th, 2018, subject to the conditions identified within this report. Number nine, authorize the city engineer and the director of the Bureau of Street Services to administratively approve two additional 58-hour weekend full clo closures starting Friday, March 23rd, 2018, at 7 p.m., and ending Monday, April 2nd, 2018, at 5 a.m., recommendation number seven above. Given the uncertainty in predicting when the tunnel boring machine will arrive at the retrieval location, and if unforeseen conditions are encountered which delay the completion of the extraction of the TBM, and 10, authorize the city engineer to administratively approve two additional weeks of peak hour exemption starting March 19, 2018, and ending March 30, 2018, recommend recommendation number eight above. Given the uncertainty in predicting when the TBM will arrive at the retrieval location, and if unforeseen circumstances, conditions are encountered which delay the completion of the extraction of the TBM. Mr. Curtis G. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for reading all those recommendations into the report. Did I, um, did I have a choice? <laughs> that or I do it. Either so one. If there's, a, if there's like an edited version, you guys can let me know that and I'll do that next time. But, but good morning. I am Curtis G. from Bureau of Engineering Metro Transit Division. The Metro Regional Connector Project slated to open in 2021 is a 1.9 mile underground light rail transit system through downtown Los Angeles that will extend from the Gold Line Little Tokyo Station to the 7th Street Metro Center. This rail extension project will connect the Metro Gold Line to the Metro Blue and Expo lines to provide a one seat ride uh, from across LA County. Metro and the contractor, RCC, are requesting to temporarily close the intersection of 4th Street and Flower Street to facilitate the extraction of the tunnel boring machine, also called TBM. The intersection closure consists of a full street closure of, Forest, of Flower Street between 4th Street and 5th Street and 4th Street between Figueroa Street and Flower Street for nine consecutive weekends starting Friday, January 19, 2018 and ending Monday, March 19, 2018. Each weekend closure will be for 58 hours and will start Friday at 7 p.m. and end Monday at 5 a.m. In addition, starting January 22nd and ending March 16, 2018, Flower Street will be reduced to two southbound lanes at the intersection of Flower Street and 4th Street 
at 4th Street will be reduced to one eastbound lane from Figueroa Street to Flower Street. The requested temporary lane reductions will create a work zone for the gantry crane needed to extract the TBM. Metro has requested a peak hour exemption to allow for the lane reductions and construction work to take place within the public streets in the morning peak hours of 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and afternoon peak hours from 3.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. The TBM retrieval shaft is located at the intersection of 4th Street and Flower Street. The TBM is a 21 and a half foot diameter machine that is mining the tunnels needed for the light rail tra trains to travel underground. The TBM started at the first and central station in Little Tokyo and is traveling west, digging the second of two 1.1 mile long tunnels through the retrieval shaft in the financial district in downtown Los Angeles. The anticipated arrival of the TBM is next week. Once the TBM arrives at the retrieval shaft, the TBM will be lifted out, placed on a truck, and that's where it will be retired from the project. The requested street closure is at, at the same location with the same traffic configuration that was implemented in the summer of 2017 when the same TBM was extracted after it completed mining the first tunnel. Given that the unforeseen conditions may rise, Metro and RCC are requesting that the city engineer and the director of Bureau of Street Services be authorized to administratively approve two additional 50-hour weekend full closures ending 5 a.m. on April 2nd, 2018, and an additional two weeks of peak hour exemption ending March 30th, 2018. The Los Angeles Department of Transportation has reviewed and approved the worksite traffic control plans for the proposed lane reductions and weekend full street closures. The LADOT will provide support services to manage traffic conditions as safely and efficiently as possible during the proposed time period. Council District 14 has communicated that they support the closure associated with this work. The LA Police Department exemption from work hour restrictions for nighttime, early morning, and Sunday construction was granted on December 12, 2017. Metro has stated that they are committed to providing advance notice and mitigating construction impacts for the financial district and downtown communities in advance of construction activities and during the life of the project. At 4 p.m. yesterday, Metro provided the Bureau of Engineering an update. When er Metro originally submitted their request for the street closure, there was some uncertainty as when the TBM would arrive. Much of this uncertainty is now known because the TBM is approximately 250 feet away from the retrieval shaft. With the TBM arriving next week, Metro does not anticipate needing the last two requested 58-hour weekend intersection closures and the last two weeks of peak hour exemption for the lane reductions on Flower Street and 4th Street. Metro will only use the necessary weekend closures and lane reductions necessary to successfully extract the TBM and will reopen streets as soon as possible. I therefore ask the board to adopt this board report with the recommendations that are listed in the report and stated at the beginning, which have been, and, and with the conditions stated here. One, pursuant to the City of Los Angeles and Metro Master Cooperative Agreement, City Council Contract Number C104288 and Joint and Board Joint Report Number One Regional Connector Special Permitting Process adopted September 12, 2014. Associated permit fees shall be waived. Two, permittees shall obtain all necessary approvals for construction work related to the aforementioned street closure prior to implementing an all and any and all street related activities. Three, permittees shall obtain a Los Angeles Police Department exemption from work hour restriction permit and comply with all permit conditions. Four, permittees shall comply with all construction related mitigation measures. Five, permittees shall comply with the peak hour exemption conditions as outlined in the Los Angeles Municipal Code section 62.61D and 80.06.1. The peak hour exemption can be revoked at any time by the city engineer. Thank you, and representatives from Metro, RCC, and LADOT are here to ask any questions, to answer any questions. Thank you, Curtis. Um, <clears throat> can I just ask a, a couple questions? Uh, the council office is 
on board with this this plan, these closures? Correct, yes. We received an email from Nate Hayward, Council of Districts 14's representative, um, indicating that they are on board with this closure and all the works related to it. Can you remind us again of the status of um, previous closures that we've approved for the regional connector? Uh, currently, there are no uh, current full closures in place except for the one uh, at, uh, it's at uh, Second and Hope, which they're doing the construction for the station, but Plow Street is still open southbound. Okay, we have a speaker on this item, uh, Mr. Christopher Sutton. Good morning again, um, Christopher Sutton, attorney for the Western Bonaventure Hotel, located at the corner of 4th and Flower Street. I've appeared many times on the various street closures that have gone forward over the last three or four years. Unlike the staff report, we believe that the CEQA findings can be improved because you can impose additional mitigation measures. Number one, you could say that none of the Bonaventure's driveways or loading docks will be blocked at any time. That's a simple thing because that's already in the MMRP, but it hasn't been enforced, and they've been blocked periodically throughout this project and even last summer when they removed the TBM. Two, impose the, the decibel residential noise limits that you and the city have imposed at every other metro construction site along Wilshire, along 2nd, along Crenshaw, wherever there's residences. Because the city has determined somehow that a hotel guest is not a resident, even though the owner of the hotel lives in the hotel. We are subject to the commercial noise standards, and we want you to impose, as under CEQA, residential decibel limits on noise standards. Number three, something I've asked for repeatedly, that you can impose, that has that MTA has imposed on itself at every other location other than Flower Street, the small business loss mitigation payments. Doesn't affect the Bonaventure ourselves, but our tenants and the other small businesses on these four blocks on Flower Street, it's the only stretch of subway construction in the entire county that is not included in the MTA's small business loss mitigation payments. And these monies came from the city. $40 million in return measure our money. Those funds have not been fully utilized on any of the other projects. They're way, there's a huge surplus, and we've asked MTA repeatedly for the last three years. I've appeared here for the last two years. We want you to impose the small business loss mitigation payment program as part of the, what's happening to the small businesses here. Um, I have other comments, but I think those are the most important ones. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I would actually like uh, to ask as a follow-up question um, about the small business loss program and the status of, of uh, applying it to this project. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Olga Arroyo. I'm the construction relations manager on the regional connector. I'm responsible for our reach as it relates to construction of this project. Uh, we have a separate unit that handles the business interruption front for the regional connector. Uh, they are unfortunately not at this meeting today. However, we can uh, get back to you with additional information. Um, just to address the public comment regarding the business interruption fund not being available in this section of the alignment, that is correct. There are two portions of the alignment that are not part of the business interruption fund, including the area around Second and Hope. Uh, despite that fact, we do have the uh, business mitigation assistance program through our uh, each shop play marketing program, and that is another tool that we can use to bring uh, visual um, awareness of businesses at the Bonaventure should the businesses choose to participate. And so, through that, we do um, a um, we visit businesses uh, with uh, different. Um, members of our team or the contractor and the public and have lunch meetups uh, at the restaurants. So that's something that we can explore with the Bonaventure and their tenants. We also provide um, marketing opportunities where we highlight them as part of either walking guides that we distribute throughout our alignment or at special events and also on our website and social media outlets. And are you currently working with the businesses in the Bonaventure in, in the way that you just described? 
not at this moment. We have attempted to work with them, and we have not received a response to move forward onto the next conversation. But we can uh, revisit that conversation with uh, tenants as well. Commissioner Pinto. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Kurt. Thank you, Olga. I have a question for Curtis. Curtis, Mr. Sutton had spoke about uh, two issues. One, uh, the Bonaventure driveway being blocked periodically. And the second is the uh, imposition of, a, of a residential decibel level enforcement. Can you talk about those, those two things? Okay, uh, regarding the driveways, I'm not there during construction, but I would like to call up um, RCC's construction manager and also uh, Metro uh, resident engineer for Flower Street. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Sala Gallagher, and I am the construction manager for the Regional Connector Project for the contractor. Um, during this past summer, we retrieved the TBM at Forth and Flower, um, and the two issues with regard to driveways and noise. Um, number one, with the driveway, um, we complied with the LADOT plans at all times. We also had um, some flagmen on the driveways to make sure cars would come out. Um, at all times and there would be no blockages to the driveways and they were kept clear and then with regard to the noise uh, we continue to do ongoing monitoring with our noise consultant Kroner Environmental at all times on the project um, and this is with the reference to all the project documentation and requirements that uh, we are upheld to by the by Metro and by the city. Great thank you I also have a question since our friend Jesus is here. Jesus in terms of the traffic control, uh, traffic management plan, all those alphabet soup things. Is, um, do we see any issues with this one? We had a good summer. Everything was complied with, correct? That's correct, Commissioner. Uh, as far as I can recall, last summer we didn't have any particular events that um, presented any major concern for us. There was some coordination that we can improve on as far as with special events and with Film LA. Uh, there, there was, you know, uh, we're looking at those type of opportunities. I think there was one situation where some detour signs may have been removed inadvertently by filming crews. So that just uh, contributes to our lessons learned for this time around, and we'll be keeping a closer eye on those type of situations. But uh, other than that, I don't recall uh, having uh, too many uh, issues. Great. Fair enough. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Commissioner Davis. I just wanted to ask for clarification. I know that um, it was testimony that there is an alternative fund for small businesses in the impacted area uh, in terms of not being a part of a traditional business fund. There was a special fund that would be available potentially for those small businesses in the area uh, that was spoken about. And is there some goal or do we have some regularly scheduled meeting uh, and ways in which we will communicate to the businesses in the impacted area about this particular alternative fund? How will we move forward in terms of assessing uh, those uh, potential uh, supports, uh, financial supports for those businesses? Commissioner Davis, again, this is Olga Royo with Metro. I'm not aware of a separate uh, fund designed to assist businesses in the area. Um, so I will take that comment back and verify with our team. So basically, as you understand it, there is nothing that we have that supports uh, any interruption that the businesses in the impacted area might have. Not for this particular area of the alignment, that's correct. We don't have a program in place that grants uh, financial support to businesses. In this area? In this area, correct. Any other questions? Uh, no, that's all. I just wanted to get those Thank back. You. Thank you very much. Um, we have a motion. Uh, to adopt this item from Commissioner Jacinto, I would like to just recommend that you guys do go back out there with the, the small businesses inside the Bonaventure and see you know, how you can make sure that um, the impact on, on uh, their success is minimized. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and second uh, this motion, this item. Um, so it will be adopted. Any objections of sending it forthwith? The item will be sent forthwith. Thank you, Mr. G. Thank you. Moving on, we have an oral report. 
Status of Construction of Public Building and Open Space Program, Bureau of Engineering. Good morning, Ms. Weintraub. Good morning, Deborah Weintraub, Chief Deputy City Engineer from the Bureau of Engineering. I'm going to quickly run you through two PowerPoint presentations that talk to two projects, two fairly sizable projects that we're working on. The first one is the Taylor Yard G2 River Park. I'm going to talk to you a bit about the project team, the site history, site possibilities, schedule funding, outreach, and next steps. Uh, these are the uh, city um, folks who are involved with the project from the mayor's office, our council member Gil Savio and the Bureau of Engineering. Our project partners include the Coastal Conservancy who have given us a grant for this initial scope of work, uh, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservation Authority who, with whom we're negotiating an easement over part of the property and the Calvary Department of Toxic Substances Control. Um, we uh, went through a, a very public process to hire our consultant team, which is led by WSP and includes all of the sub-consultants that you see listed on um, this slide. Uh, the notice to proceed for our consultant work was October 20th of 2017. So this gives you a little bit of background on the Taylor Yard site. It's a 42-acre site, uh, which was part of a larger um, railroad property. Um, on the right of this side, you see some of the open spaces that are in close proximity, and this is uh, riverfront property that gives us enormous opportunity for habitat creation. It's long been um, a site that um, folks working on the river felt would be a great addition to um, river revitalization efforts. On this side, I show you in closer detail some of the communities uh, that are nearby and the site that the city purchased. And this visually gives you some sense of the connection to some of the adjacent areas. Um, just to the north of this site, there's a large uh, open space parcel owned by state parks called the Bowtie Parcel, and we will work in close coordination with them. They've yet to develop that property. So with all of the land that is open space in this area, there's a, over 100 acres of open space that is either developed or in the process of being developed along the river. This is a, um, a brownfield site. There are known areas of contamination. Um, we are working with DTSC right now with a work plan for investigating the site. We have an agreement with them where we've talked about phasing the remediation because the goal is to try and open portions of the site as soon as possible to the public. We'll start um, extensive on-site investigations later, uh, actually next month in February. Just a little bit of background. The site was a grocery and milling company owned by J. Hartley Taylor. I, we always wondered where the Taylor Yard name came from. Um, the Southern Pacific Railroad established, established a stop at Mr. Taylor's mill and then purchased the two, a 244 acre site for railroad maintenance operations. The river was channelized in the 30s by the Corps of Engineers, though in this stretch there's, it's a soft bottom, just the sides are concrete. Uh, this one portion, this 42 acres, was the last piece that Union Pacific, who then, uh, who, who was the last owner of the site, owned. Um, due to a generous grant from the California Coastal Conservancy, we're embarking on this early stage of site evaluation and design. These are just some photographs to give you a sense of what's on the site right now. We've had early discussions with the Department of Water and Power about relocating these high voltage power lines bring them um, into the interior uh, border of the site along the rail line that runs between this and the adjacent parkland. And then just some of what it looks like. It's actually quite a spectacular spot along the river. Some of the other images, you see the soft bottom river there. There are wildlife that do currently, you can currently see on the site. There were many studies uh, on this site. This site, slide just gives you some references back to 92 of work that had been done to imagine what could happen here. The most recent was the, um, the Army Corps of Engineers um, ecosystem feasibility study that, uh, that the city council approved. Um, we see this as both a neighborhood and regional destination, which would be an open space focused on habitat restoration and um, uh, a place for viewing nature. When the city purchased the site, we created this diagram based on what we knew to date for areas of the site that were contaminated. And on this diagram, the yellow areas are areas that we believe we can more quickly open to the public. 
and potentially create a 1.2 mile perimeter walking path. Um, the small dots in the middle of that yellow area are the potential for 50 campsites. The adjacent state parks has been doing camping on their side as well. And then potentially by repaving the gray area of um, having a parking lot that could have a farmer's market or other special events. We're embarking on a extensive community outreach and stakeholder process. Um, we've already held two technical advisory or two committee meetings. One is a technical advisory committee, the other is a um, community leadership committee, and that was held the end of December. And we showed them largely the same PowerPoint I'm showing you. I included some slides for, uh, in order to shorten it this morning. We showed them some examples of other riverfront parks or spaces that are habitat focused, open space with passive recreation. That's what these slides demonstrate, including some of our own projects in the city. Uh, some of the activities, there currently is kayaking in the river. There's the opportunity for art and also lookout points to view birds and nature, uh, shade structures, uh, community open space. This basically gives you our schedule. We're using this year, the calendar year of 2018, to come up with our design proposals. Um, this breaks down for you the funding and we will continue to be work with our partners to look for additional funding. Um, and then the upcoming meetings, which are important to our constituents, which is we're doing a site tour on January 20th between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. Anyone who shows up properly dressed with closed-toed closed shoes, um, we will um, provide a tour of the site. And our next, our first really public open design workshop meeting is January 24th. Um, at the Sonia Sotomayor Learning Academy. Okay, then I would like to show you um, and one other one other slide. If you want to close this one, open the other. Well, this is a very important and large project, and I'm thrilled to be working on it. I've, we've talked about Taylor Yard for my entire 15 years, 16 years that I've been with the city. The other sizable project that I wanted to briefly um, update the board on is the LA Street Civic Building. So the LA Street Civic Building is going to be a new civic office building um, at the location of the old Parker Center. Next slide. Um, go back one, I think you skipped one. Yeah, so this plan that um, is in front of you now is basically our demolition plan and our demolition documents are out for bid. Uh, bids are due February 21st for the demolition of the old Parker Center as well as uh, excavation of streets surrounding the site in order to put um, uh, IT uh, distribution lines in. Next slide. So this was um, the uh, diagram, this is a diagram of what was approved with the EIR that council approved. It will be a new approximately 750 plus square foot building um, and approximately 450 feet tall. Uh, projected construction cost approximately $420 million. Next. As part of the EIR, this diagram was included to show a new office building in the blue, some public uses in the purple, and then a real connection between the Civic Center and the Little Tokyo community. And this remains our objective in terms of design and site plan. Next. We currently have a task order solicitation out for um, proposals. It includes three major components is a detailed facilities program, architectural engineering performance specifications, and a draft Civic Center Master Plan Pedestrian Design Guideline. Next. We're, um, we work closely with a citywide task force for the LA Street Civic Building, um, under, which is under the direction of the CAO's office. Um, they are working with cons a consultant team, which includes EY, Ernst & Young, and IDI to look at alternative delivery mechanisms for the project. And they're looking at our typical uh, design bid build, also a design build delivery mechanism, and then variations on design build finance um, operate and maintain. That report should be done, I think in early February, and then we'll go to council for them to give us instructions about how to deliver the project. So the actual delivery mechanism could be an alternative delivery mechanism to our standard process 
yet to be determined. Um, so our task order solicitation for these three kind of pre-design activities that I mentioned was sent out on November 20th. Um, we expect responses back February 7th. We will do interviews and then uh, be back to the board towards the end of February to get your concurrence. And that concludes my presentation. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Deborah, as always, um, <clears throat> for your terrific work. I, uh, on Taylor Yard, <clears throat> I know it's not <clears throat> really a part of this first know just a very initial project we're doing out there but what are your thoughts on on s stormwater capture and cleanup and how soon can we start to see some of those elements <clears throat> be put in as you know we've been you know dealing with um, uh, the water quality issues in the LA River impacting kayaking season and, and I think it's important for me that we you know is uh, that we make really maximize use of this parcel to start to address the problem. So I, I, I anticipate that stormwater capture and um, water quality improvement will be part of some of our initial steps because there are Prop O funds that were set aside for this site. So um, in the very near term, in terms of getting uh, the public on site, that may happen before the stormwater quality uh, improvements are put in, but it will be part of all of our planning. Our goal is to create interim uses that don't prevent the long-term uses include and the long-term site um, um, elements such as stormwater quality issues from, from happening. So it will be very much part of our conversation. Okay. <clears throat> and on the uh, LA Street Civic Building, so this is obviously a part of a larger Civic Center master plan, correct? Can you talk a little bit about how this piece, the you know, construction of this piece will fit in with that larger plan? So the CAO's office produced a Civic Center master plan that was um, presented to City Council. Um, and it basically looked at a kind of phased development of the Civic Center to create both uh, city buildings and also potentially private buildings in the Civic Center. So this is the first piece of that. And the goal of this building is to do some consolidation of city offices, potentially to sell or lease city, off city offices that are where people would be relocated to the Civic Center. Um, the reason at part of our toss are these design guidelines is there is concern that as we do this first step, we begin to create a real integrated neighborhood in terms of aesthetics. So starting this first step, we'll sort of lay the groundwork for what the rest of the projects would will look like and feel like what we want at the ground level, what kind of buildings we want to create down here. What is the status of the LA Mall? Uh, so the LA Mall was part of the Civic Center Master Plan and uh, to the best of my knowledge, I, I don't believe there's any uh, plans right now for redevelopment, but um, it is part of the Master Plan is identified as a location for new buildings in the Civic Center. I just feel that it's such an underutilized asset. Um, you know, we, I mean, we're downtown is, is happening and there's uh, a lot of restaurants and places for people to go um, in the evening. And I feel like, you know, we could offer parking, which a lot of other, you know, buildings can't offer. Um, and I, I just, you know, wish that we could expedite whatever we're eventually gonna do to bring the mall or the plaza above it um, into the sort of the, the, the larger life happening around downtown LA. I absolutely agree with you. One of the things about this project is as we pursue an alternative delivery mechanism where we bring in an outside entity that might design, build, and finance, that might be a model that could be used for the mall. So I think this is kind of a uh, leader project for potentially redeveloping. Thank you, Vice President Repenning. Excellent questions and comments to, to Deborah. I want to congratulate you, Deborah, on your leadership, along with our city engineer, Gary Lee Moore. Um, when I think of our bureau's um, mandate to transform Los Angeles into the most livable and sustainable city, that's exactly what we're doing in terms of taking our as built and seeing how we can transform this crown jewel of the LA River and G2 and Taylor Yard and and the, um, the, um, the mall, the Civic Mall uh, central plan 
will transform this downtown or this central part over the next 10 years. And uh, I, I also want to encourage us to, to, to really prioritize LA Mall in terms of its utilization because it is so underutilized. But, but in, law, in, in fulfillment of the mayor's vision and the city council's partnership and leadership too, this is exactly what we're able to do at this point in time in our city's history. And I think that we're doing great work and it takes a dedicated staff uh, to be able to engage the public and get the best in terms of uh, what is, what constituents, what, what residents and what businesses need. So I, I would encourage us to, to stay the course and have these community engagements, uh, the walks, all that is so important to inform us of how we make the projects relevant for those that it's most affecting. So thank you, Mayor. there is another set of minutes that need our approval um, so I'm going to make the motion to approve the minutes from Monday December 11th 2017 is there a second seconded by Commissioner Davis the minutes will be approved uh, Dr. Combos have we cleared the desk yes you have okay um, thank you very much uh, our meeting is now adjourned